Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Brooke Messer. I'm an optometrist at Vance Thompson Vision, and I have the pleasure of spending the next half hour or so with Dr. Vance Thompson himself. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Welcome to Advanced Patient Care, um, an exclusive podcast series by Vance Thompson Vision. Our purpose is to keep you at the forefront of the optometry field through dynamic insights, practical clinical tips, in and engaging expert discussions. Join us on a journey of continuous learning and professional growth as we delve into the latest advancements in eye care. Our mission is to empower eye care providers with the knowledge and tools to provide exceptional patient care. At Advanced Patient Care, we are dedicated to elevating eye care one episode at a time. All right, so as I said, I'm Dr. Brooke Messer. I practice in the West Fargo Vance Thompson Vision Clinic alongside our surgeon, Dr. Mike Greenwood, and fellow optometrists, Nick Risbrut and Seth Stofferin. And again, ha Vance, so happy to be with you here today to talk about a mutual passion point. Um, we're talking about myopia today. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. It's an absolute honor to be here with you. And um, I have a, a ton of respect uh, for what you are doing in our field to, you know, not only help patients that, you know, need surgical correction, but how do we make this world a healthier and better place for those young myopes so they have a, a the best visual life possible? What you're doing at the Myopia Control Institute, you know, at Vance Thompson Vision. I look up to you and I've really been looking forward to this conversation. I really have too. You know, we started talking about myopia together even before I was at Vance Thompson Vision back in 2019. I joined Vance Thompson Vision in 2020 and um, I found it really remarkable that, you know, we had of course, the mutual uh, interest is, of course, you know, best eye care, staying advanced, you know, staying on top of technology, even just finding that we had a mutual uh, interest kind of outside the norm of ophthalmology and, you know, the co-management scenario or setup that we have here. And so I, again, I think I have you to thank for kind of help pave the way for the acceptance and the awareness of myopia control um, in our fields. And um, today, you know, our typically our podcasts are geared toward educating other providers. However, we've learned that there are patients that have kind of trickled in to tune into these podcasts as well. Um, so just to kind of bring everyone up to speed, Vance, can you tell us, you know, what is myopia? You know, what are we talking about today? Well, you know, we're talking to a, a group of very sophisticated doctors uh, who know what uh, myopia is, but I think that this idea, especially axial elongation and myopia, not only obviously being an optical issue and a refractive error, but just what we've learned over the years about how it's also it can become pathologic and, and, and the eye health issues. And I think we've all done a pretty darn good job of telling myopes over the years that they have a, you know, higher chance of, you know, cataracts and glaucoma and retinal issues. But the data that's happened by studying large populations and what happens with any increase in myopia increases uh, the uh, chance and rate of these different pathologies, um, how what we do now can influence their life so much in the next you know decades of life. And, and so taking this from not just an optical issue, but a, an actual pathology, that how do we limit that axial elongation and those physical changes that occur and potentially negatively affect their visual life and that we actually can play a huge role in helping them is the part that fascinates me. And so I think that, you know, the main main reason you are so focused on this and, and I'm so interested in it and refer a lot of patients for myopia management and myopia control is, is this pathologic side of it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing it because frankly, I'd like to see more optometrists talking about it with their patients, or either referring patients for it or treating them for myopia. Yeah. And that brings up a good point about kind of bringing everyone more awareness, both like parents, patients, and providers as well. Um, and so something that I've learned since being at Vance Thompson Vision is our model of care is, you know, 
allowing those uh, around us to do everything they can to the best that they can, then there may be cases where they're less comfortable. So maybe some are more comfortable managing myopia in some ways, but not in others. And that's kind of my goal being here in Fargo is, you know, I want to be here to support our referral network that if they want to manage myopia with a certain method, say soft lenses or eye drops like atropine, um, but maybe not quite interested in orthokeratology. However, if they think they have a patient that is best suited for ortho -K, then that's what I'm here for. And I think it's, it's really neat the way that the myopia management has grown here in Fargo in that, you know, the referrals we get are are truly the patients that are more challenging and the we're seeing more and more patients being managed um, or having their myopia managed um, from a control aspect, the more we educate and the more we talk about it. So it's been really neat to watch that grow um, here in Fargo. And so just kind of building on what you said about, you know, myopia, it's nearsightedness. Um, and something that's happening right now is the prevalence of myopia has doubled in the last 20 years and it's anticipated to affect half the globe in 20. And for a long time, myopia was considered, at least high myopia was considered a condition of patients in Asian population groups. And so we didn't really consider Caucasians, you know, largely where, where we're at in our demographics to be affected by high myopia. Um, but there's lots of data now showing, as you can see in this graph here, that patients of European descent and Asian descent were actually uh, progressing in myopia at the same rate in both ethnic ethnicities. So we really can't, you know, write it off to be being like, oh, you only need to do myopia management if you're managing patients of Asian backgrounds. So again, the the prevalence of myopia is just exploding. And there's certainly some aspect um, or some attribution to the COVID pandemic and continued near work and, and screen time and things like that in kids where they do now that we're seeing sort of the the changes in those kids' visions post-pandemic, they are con considering, you know, that to be a a big a big contributor to the increased rate of myopia that we see in our patients. So, Vance, in addition to maybe the COVID pandemic, what do we know about why myopia is the prevalence is increasing? Well, our world has, as you know, shifted close. If we think about centuries ago, I, we did a lot of things at a distance, and with the use of computers and mobile devices and combining that with the genetic aspect, we're just seeing such an explosion. And if you think about half the world population being myopic by 2050, the, the, you just think about the children right now that you're taking care of are the children that are going to be adults and make up that, you know, half of the population by 2050. So we are taking care of that exploding myopic population right now. And so this, this idea of more time indoors, on devices, and all these things that we can be helping people understand our issues and that there's things we can be doing about it is, is, is just, just so powerful. But we need to be doing it right now. Consider this uh, an urgent health issue for our whole wide world. Yeah. And why do you think, you know, you're just alluding into that? It's an issue for the world. Um, and I wrote that here, global health and quality of life issue. Why is it a global health concern? Well, I think it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's it's going to very negatively, you know, affect their visual health on the long run. And a lot of these things that occur, especially, you know, retinal issues and, and glaucoma, optic nerve damage issues are permanent. I, you hear me talk about this all the time, and I know you do too, Brooke, but I also ask every patient if they rub their eyes. And I'm amazed at this younger patient population. And some of it, I think, has to do with, you know, the modern day diet, um, but the dry eyes and allergies that occur even in this younger population. I'm very aggressive about asking every patient uh, if they rub their eyes or you know, those types of things. And sometimes I even say it before I introduce myself because I just, just don't want to forget yeah. it. I imagine when they push on their eyes and I explain to them, you know, how it, you know, boom, it, it makes the, the, the back of their eye stretch. It makes mm -hmm. the vitreous shift, posterior staphylomas worse, yep. retinal detachments, higher rate. So patients don't realize they can, they can change their own refractive air whether it's by too much time on their cell phone or their computer 
or eye rubbing. And so helping them with behavior modifications and some of the modern day treatment modalities that we're going to be talking about are so important to be talking about with every patient. Yeah, I often describe it um, when we talk about kind of that globe manipulation. Um, you know, I think about a balloon and if you squeeze it in the middle, you know, it gets longer. And like the longer mm -hmm. you do that, if you tie something around the middle of the balloon and then eventually you take it off, the balloon's going to be more elongated than it was to start with. And so, um, and you talk about like the stretching of the fibers. And uh, and I think that's kind of where the genetic aspect plays in is some people's genetics just allow for that little bit more stretchiness. Uh, and so they tolerate the, you know, the ciliary body contraction that squeezes that midline of the globe. Uh, they tolerate it less and you get that axial elongation from the stretching. I mean, maybe that's just me babbling, but that's where I kind of feel like that squeeze, that axial elongation, um, kind of in addition to the the manipulation from eye rubbing and things like that. So couldn't be more on the same page with you on those types of topics. And I think something else that is important for providers to know is even though the field of this is called myopia control and it's about you know, progressing refractive error, or that's what it's kind of seems to be over time, but really as technology has evolved and the access um, to measuring axial length has grown, especially in optometry, that it really, it's about axial length control. If they change a little bit more in myopia for whatever reason, cornea or lens, something like that, but their axial length stays the same, we kind of still consider that a win. Um, so really it's about the axial length and the, the change in the axial length, you know, for the worse or longer is where these health conditions, you know, come into play. And so, you know, maybe over time we'll see that shift when we're talking more about not so much myopia control as it is axial length control, because that's the goal there. And, um, you know, these d studies here are again, like focused around refractive error, which of course is tied to longer axial lengths. Um, but again, I think over time we'll see more data coming out tied to axial length, three axial lengths, excuse me, reach, you know, X, Y, Z. This is when disease changes by certain rates. But, you know, high myopia certainly comes with risk factors. And, you know, at minus six, we have a five times higher odds ratio for retinal detachment and a 40 times higher odds ratio for retinal detachment once you reach minus 10. And that's just exponential. And then myopic macular degeneration compared to emetropes, myopes with minus six to minus 10 have a 72 times higher odds for myopic macular degeneration and eight times higher odds for myopic macular degeneration once you reach minus 10. And when we talk about myopia here in North Dakota at our symposiums or other, you know, educational events, uh, Dr. Greenwood and myself look at each other because we're both, you know, Dr. Greenwood is a high myope and I'm pushing that minus six number. And, you know, we kind of look at ourselves. We both have, you know, myopic spouses and we're like, dang, like these are real things that this could affect us. And, you know, being in eye care and being more aware of, you know, it's like, who knew that myopia has its own macular degeneration? So this really hits home for me on like my kids and you know, what I can do for them to um, protect their eyes over the length of their, you know, over their, their life. So really, um, like this title of the slide says, you know, every diopter matters. The risk for myopic macular degeneration increases by 67 for every diopter. And that huge. should really hit home to all of us as eye care providers. It's just absolutely huge numbers, Brooke. I mean, and, and I, I like to talk about risk stacking this idea of genetics being a risk and this idea of environment being a risk and this idea of eye rubbing being a risk. And when you look at these numbers, imagine, you know, I mean, I know we'll be talking about treatment modalities in a little bit, but in the uh, care study, if I can remember right, what the care study uh, stood for, it was cumulative, it, yep. it was cumulative absolute reduction yes. in axial elongation. And so cumulative being, you know, this idea of, of all these various risks, and then you take something like orthokeratology, and over a seven year period compared to, you know, kids wearing single vision lenses, there was a millimeter reduction in axial length in the ortho -K group. And so when you when you show this slide of these huge numbers uh, that, you know, I mean, I mean, 72 times higher, yeah. eight times higher, just imagine if you can help someone over a seven year period, millimeters 
yep. less axial elong elongation. And what that does to protect the physical aspect of their eye, mm -hmm. it's, it's stunning. And we can't let that happen. I totally agree. And that, I mean, that eight, that 845 times, you know, it's, we don't see minus 10 a lot, Amazing. but there's a lot of people out there that are minus 10. And, um, I measured my axial length this morning and, uh, I'm a 25 and the, uh, that first kind of tier of elevated risk happens at 26 millimeters. So I may be like, We'll see, but I wish that we had that when I was younger. I wish we had these opportunities to control myopia and not be walking around around a minus five. So um, again, and that goes back to being younger. Um, something else that I think is really interesting in some of the data is that it's not the rate of progression. It's not the level of myopia. When you start talking about contact lenses for kids, um, the biggest predictor for high myopia is age of onset. And so for me, um, you know, these studies here show seven or eight years old when we have a myopia onset around age seven. So that's, you know, first grade or so. And that was me. I was eight when I've got my first pair of glasses. They're at a significantly higher risk for high myopia in adulthood. And the prevalence of myopic macular degeneration also goes up with high myopia. And um, this paper here kind of ties everything together that, you know, the younger you are when myopia onsets, the higher your risk for myopic macular degeneration in adulthood. And so that's another kind of take home for providers. If you're a provider and you're watching today, you know, what I would like you to take with you is that if you have a seven-year-old and they're a minus one, you don't get to write it off. They're a seven, they're a myo, they're at high risk for high myopia in adulthood. That's the most amazing time to start treating, even if it's just something simple like an atropine drop in the evening. Again, the it's the age of onset that we really need to take home and kind of hold that as gold standard when we start talking about myopia control. You know, Brooke, it fascinates me actually that you know your myopia and your axial length boom boom. And I I think <laughs> that we should be, I think we should be talking about them in 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 tandem like that. The same care study showed that axial length you know, was up to 10 times more accurate than refraction in monitoring progression. And so you can automatically get an idea for your risk factors based on your axial length. And so this early onset, you know, measuring an axial length is a quite easy thing to do. And mm -hmm. if you don't have the technology, we do. And we're more than happy uh, to do that for you. But when that early onset happens, get that axial length. I, I think of it kind of like if you have a spot on your chest x-ray, you sure like seeing 10 years ago, you had that spot. And, yeah. and, and so it's, it's just a, a great way to, to, to monitor over time. And so to know that not only are they minus three, uh, but their axial length is, you know, 24. And then in, you know, a year or two, how is that comparing? If they're now a minus five, what's happening with their axial length to, to, to monitor both, but realize the axial length is actually more predictive? Yes, absolutely. And again, it's that stretching that brings in the, you know, the disease states and everything that raise our concerns. And so, yeah, like if I can't get an accurate refraction, um, sometimes I... I don't get all worked up about it if I have axial length measurements. And so, yes, axial length is quickly uh, rising as the gold standard in monitoring patients with myopia. Oh, I think oh. that what I what I also just want to say that I appreciate you saying, Brooke, is there really, I just don't think we can say there is a safe level of myopia that you really want to understand. It's It's a risk factor in and of itself, and we need to know that axial length for that patient. Yeah, and there's actually, um, I didn't include it in this PowerPoint here, but um, I have it in other myopia lectures that um, 30% of myopic macular degeneration cases are in patients that have refractive errors less than, my there is no safe level of myopia, um, oh. especially in children because of that time for them to progress. I've actually also heard the statistic that reducing the rate of myopia progression by 50% can reduce the prevalence of high myopia by up to 90%. And, and so when you talk about those huge numbers of increasing physical issues, you have it in your control to help that patient have a safer visual life.
Yeah. And I like to compare it to something like glaucoma. You know, if you were able to affect their glaucoma progression risk by 90%, like everybody would be doing it. And that's the same with myopia. Like we, everybody needs to jump on board with that excitement. I'm like leaning into my screen because I just want to, you know, just that the passion is just, you're doing such an amazing job bringing uh, these important points forward. And it's just such a great opportunity. And that kind of brings in uh, my next slide here is Vance, you were inducted as president of the ASCRS recently. Um, we know that you're a medical advisor to many groups and companies and you know, your passion is just showing through here on this discussion. Why does myopia make the cut when there is so much on your plate and so much that you do in ophthalmology? Like, how does it, how does it, how does it still kind of stick to the top for you? Well, um, as you know, my specialty is refractive and cataract surgery. And I am really passionate about and, and performed a lot of clinical trials and laser vision correction, phacic eye wells, and, and lens replacement. Because of that, I see a lot of myopic parents. And I remember people starting to talk about myopia management as far as what I can remember really being in this century. But in the 90s, I remember seeing my first ortho-K patients that were fit by area uh, optometrists, and I was just fascinated with how there was this beautiful topography change, and these patients were either lower or no uh, refractive air. And so originally, just as a refractive surgeon, I had a mutual respect for uh, ortho-K. But I... I remember when the CEO then of Euclid, uh, his name was Bruce DeWolfson, came to Sioux Falls, knowing that I was actively involved in clinical research and cornea and uh, laser and implants and asked me to get involved with his, his company. And I said, yes, I have a, a, a lot to learn by this non-surgical way of helping people enjoy some time periods without being dependent on optical devices. And so my curiosity was there, but then it blended into starting, it actually lessened the rate of, of myopic progression. And even then I wasn't aware of the risks. So there was, there was a progression of, of fascination with ortho K and, and then, you know, this idea of people becoming less myopic and then large groups studies of of people, um, you know, having safer visual lives because their myopia was not advancing as quickly because of the ortho K. So it was kind of like one thing led to another. And as a result, I've been working with that same company for over 25 years. And so Euclid has been a, a very important, and that's what led to me getting involved with, with, with Treehouse when uh, Gary Gerber uh, came and, and asked me to be involved as an advisor with Treehouse to teach more doctors in eye care about how to deliver real quality ortho -K. You know, being a subspecialist, I have a lot of respect for, you know, experts. And I've, I've, I've always almost started doing ortho -K myself, but every time I study it, there's so many nuances that even though I enjoy being an advisor to a company that delivers it, when I hear people like you, who you know is a world expert in it, I, I'm intimidated by, I, I don't think, unless I was gonna just do a very deep dive, I could do as good a job. So I refer them to people like, like you, but that's how one thing kind of led to another. And I got in, involved with, you know, myopia management, it started with ortho -K. I think that's really neat. And, you know, your journey kind of validates mine in that, you know, introduced to ortho -K in optometry school and saw a few patients during my residency. And then I joined a practice with Dr. Jason Jedlica in Minneapolis, and he was extremely passionate about myopia. In fact, you know, has designed some of his own lenses. And, you know, through learning alongside him and growing our myopia practice prior to moving to North Dakota and joining Vance Thompson Vision, I think the the most amazing thing is, again, like seeing it work and seeing the parents, you know, appreciative and in how it's, you know, it's working. The kids love it. 
their vision's great. And then their, their eyes are staying stable. And then moving into some of the more advanced technologies where now it's really neat to be able to use instrumentation to create a fit simulation. You know, it's kind of like the wavefront guided optimization and all the fancy stuff in LASIK where you can kind of see like, this is an, this is a very customized treatment. And that's where myopia management is going. Of course, now we can do all these simulations on our topographers to create a custom ortho K lens. And then you further customize their plan with adding in atropine or something else, um, you know, and coaching around visual hygiene with time outdoors and, you know, good lighting and things like that. So it is, once you kind of get into it, you, you're just, you're in, right. You just, you're in, you love it. And just, you know, so appreciate everything it does for our patients. So I think we've kind of established you know, why myopia control matters and, you know, why we do it. I'm just going to take a quick second to talk about a few of the modalities, um, and then we're going to dive into our mutual favorite, uh, orthokeratology. Spectacle lenses for myopia control, um, currently not approved in the U.S., but they do have them in Canada and abroad, um, and the data is pretty good, actually. I think it's going to be a real game changer for patients once it is available in the United States, because there ultimately are still some parents that don't feel their children are a good candidate for contact lenses. And, you know, they're a little bit concerned about switching into something like that. And it just improves the ability for all practitioners to provide myopia control options um, in their practices. So I look forward to, you know, spectacle lenses being approved in the United States. It's kind of been like next year or sometime next quarter for about a decade, it feels. So it's like painfully slow, but looking forward to that. Um, soft contact lenses for myopia control. Uh, there are some that there is a, a one that is FDA approved. That's the MySight lens. Um, it's FDA approved for myopia control. And there's another one that's approved for what they call myopia management. Uh, and then there's a handful of custom soft lens designs that can be done. And so I do think soft lenses have a place in myopia control, uh, especially if maybe both parents wear soft contacts and they're just more comfortable with that for their child. Um, and so all in all, you know, soft contacts are, are a good option too. And they have good rates of control when properly fit and worn by the patient. Uh, and then atropine, um, it's a low dose atropine. There's various concentrations kind of being studied right now with zero point concentration kind of leading the way as mono, if it's monotherapy uh, and that's used at night before bed. Uh, and there's some good data around it. There's a little bit of how do we taper it off concerns to avoid rebound. Um, but I do think that when a child is not a good candidate for a contact lens, um, atropine is still a great option. And there's a lot of energy being put into atropine right now. Um, so hopefully as time goes forward, we get more clear data on the use of atropine um, so that it can be a meaningful, uh, well, it's still meaningful, but so that it can be even more prescribed with more, um, not accuracy, maybe you can help me with the word uh, Vance, but just, you know, more confidence in the protocols, I would say maybe a more standardized treatment method. Because again, I think there is a place for atropine and myopia control. Right. And and I think that, uh, you know, one of the, the beauties of these treatments is they are, are, are low risk and you can monitor their effectiveness with mm -hmm. the axial length and the myopia. And, and so I'm fascinated with, you know, uh, uh, there's practitioners who kind of have their go-to to start with, and then they, they may add or, or try something different. My question to you, uh, Brooke, is, is, if you start a treatment modality, um, how long before you see that patient again and decide if you're going to add uh, something to it? Like, for instance, if you're doing ortho K, how often do you, when do you kind of check their axial length again to see if you want to, for instance, even add, add some atropine? Yeah. So our established ortho K wearers, I see them every six months um, and it for axial length uh, measurements. As long as that looks good, of course, we'll maintain course. So if I see change at my first axial length uh, measurement, so let's say I dispense an ortho K lens and then, you know, we do the fitting, get them in a good spot. And then I see them for that mid-year axial length check. I don't always change course right away. Um, sometimes I'll have them back in like two or three months um, because we never know like what their course of progression was when we initiated that primary treatment. Um, so I don't want to jump the gun too early and make them take an eye drop, you know, if they don't have to. So if it's at the six month, I see change from the primary measurement, I may uh, have them back at three months to see what's going on. If that is then stable, then I maybe won't make a change. But if it is further progressed, 
then that's when I'll consider adding atropine. And that's kind of, you know, par for the course. So if it's, you know, once we're established and we're nice and stable, and then we see a dip, I'll usually bring them back at some point before the next six month check, just to make sure that this isn't a weird measurement or something like that. And then I'll add in atropine. It's kind of like, you know, managing a patient glaucoma. I don't want to tie them to a drop if they don't really need it. So I kind of want to prove to myself that, yep, this is true progression. And then we'll add in adjunct therapy. I'm going to talk a little bit about how my uh, emetropic eyes change in axial length compared to myopic eyes. And I think that's been a real game changer in um, evaluating those, what they call age match controls. And that's been really helpful in helping me decide if I need to add adjunct therapy sooner than later. Yeah. So again, we're going to talk a little bit about ortho K because that's kind of our mutual passion. And it's, I think there's just so many benefits beyond vision, which we'll get into in a little bit, but um, Vance, do you want to introduce ortho K to us, please? Yeah. So you know, this idea of using a reverse geometry lens to flatten the cornea is uh, something that's been around for, you know, quite some time. And we we all know that, you know, ear tear interface is the most powerful focusing element of the eye and the anterior curvature of the cornea is what defines the curvature of the tear film. Uh, and so if we can flatten the cornea, we flatten the ear tear interface and we, you know, lessen myopia. So this idea of sleeping uh, in this reverse, reverse geometry lens to create this depression uh, in a very predictable way. I mean, the accuracy fascinates me. The majority of the effect being epithelial, you know, we're always trying to we, we debate a little bit about how much of the effect is stromal, um, but the beauty of it all is it is, you know, reversible. And that's one of the most powerful uh, things that I think patients love about this non-surgical way of reducing the corneal curvature. Patients are oftentimes fascinated by the fact that they may have three diopters of, of myopia, but that their cornea has you know, let's say 45 unit, units of curving power. And if we can, like I'll tell patients, lessen that, you know, this isn't the exact math, but I try to keep it very, very simple in my patient discussions. If we can lessen that curvature from, you know, 45 units of curving power to 42 by you sleeping in the contact lens, uh, then, you know, your nearsightedness is gone for a while and you can enjoy... Um, you know, a certain time period of, of spectacle or contact lens independence. And so that's my simple way, Brooke. I know that you have a, you know, more detailed way. Yeah, that is one thing that parents kind of, they almost everybody does like, a, oh, you know, kind of a shock in their chair when I say that you wear it at night and take it off in the morning and they can see. And so they're like, oh, he'll be able to run through the sprinklers or go swimming or play basketball with no glasses on, you know, like, oh, do they wear glasses during the day? Nope. It's, it's, you're corrected. And so sometimes I'll actually say it's kind of like temporary LASIK where we change the shape of the eye and um, correct the vision for that time. Um, I'll also use an example of like a retainer after braces, you know, you wear the retainer at night, it keeps your teeth aligned and you take it out during the day. Um, and you just use that for maintenance. Um, and that kind of hits home that that concept to parents. But when it comes to ortho-K and how it works in myopia control, basically we have these three images here and I'll kind of talk through them from left to right. And so when we have a patient who's myope uncorrected, um, you'll see that the image plane, which is the big arc in front of the, the retina there, it lands um, anterior to the macula and that's what leads to that blur. So then we move to that middle uh, image where when we add in some sort of myopic correction, whether it be single vision spectacles or single vision contact lenses, that whole image plane moves back to match up with the uh, macula. However, the image plane is now posterior or behind the mid peripheral retina. And there is some thought that the mid peripheral retina holds the stimulus or the, the power of the axial length um, for the for the eye to grow longer. And so that mid peripheral retina wants to match up with that image plane posterior to it. And that's what kind of stimulates that axial lengthening. So then you end up back at the first image 
where you have the mid peripheral retina lining up with the image plane, but your macula is then not aligned and they're blurry again. And so that's kind of the thought around traditional correction is that you can, where you're competing with the macula and the mid peripheral retina, and that promotes axial elongation. There are many theories to axial elongation related to myopia, and this is probably a piece of it. But, you know, again, this is how I like to explain it to parents because it's very easy to see when you kind of draw it out on paper. So when we do ortho K, ortho K actually curves the image plane. And of course, you know, people who wear ortho K don't actually see this. They don't see that peripheral vision change because um, I kind of call it non-seeing or non-vision non retina, where it actually pulls the image plane in front of the mid-peripheral retina and lines up the image with the macula. So now that mid-peripheral retina is happy, as is the macula. Therefore, we decrease that stimulus for axial lengthening. And that's been the best way for me to explain it to parents on how both ortho-K and uh, soft uh, custom soft lenses for myopia control. Uh, they have what we call dual focus or multifocal optics, um, and they work to change that image plane so that we can decrease that that axial lengthening. Now, um, you know, before we talked a little bit about your introduction into myopia control and, you know, your early fascination with ortho K for a while, uh, maybe, you know, 10 years ago or so, there was a little bit of concern or maybe more than a little bit of concern in ophthalmology on ortho K. It was maybe the overnight wear manipulation of the cornea. Can you comment a little bit on where you feel ortho keratology is at in ophthalmology now? Because I do feel that the tides are changing a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And 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 so I think that the large studies and the data has really led to that. This idea of ortho K protecting uh, the eye from axial elongation and that over a seven year period, someone in single vision lenses can end up with a, a 25 axial length. And if they are using oral, ortho K, it'd be a 25 to be that significant in and of itself is one of the reasons that I think, you know, ophthalmology uh, looked at it. Yet ortho K, ortho K is, you know, kind of a, a two benefit technology. You know, you get the, the spectacle independence, but you get greater eye physical health on the long run with, you know, much less, you know, reduction in retinal detachments and, and glaucoma and those types of things. But then when you look at large populations, and, and see that the risk of what we all worry about, infectious keratitis, is less with ortho K than it is with, you know, soft contact lenses. And we know that, that the soft contact lens infectious keratitis risk is something uh, very acceptable. Of course, you know, nobody wants it, but with proper care, we know it's actually very low. Same thing with, with ortho K. So when you start to combine the the large data that's come for, you know, improving eye safety with lessening axial elongation and that the actual treatment modality has very low risk. And oh, by the way, there's also a big patient benefit. I think that's one of the big reasons that uh, you you have found that ortho K has, has grown quite a bit in pediatric ophthalmology referring patients for ortho K which has spread into the rest of ophthalmology and into the rest of medicine. I mean, pediatricians are now educating and coaching their patients to, to get their, their eyes checked and to look into things like this. And really uh, heartening to me to, to see that this isn't just op optometry talking about the benefits, it's also ophthalmology and it's also uh, the rest of medicine starting to really understand its benefits. Yeah, and I agree that kind of the safety data has really helped support the use of ortho K kind of even across optometry too. You know, there was concern in optometry as well for the overnight wear and everything that's associated with overnight contact lens wear. And I think the big difference with ortho K, of course, is that they don't wear their lenses during the daytime where continuous wear, day and night wear of soft lenses, the cornea never really gets that break. And then they're exposed to, you know, the water in the shower, washing the face, you know, things like that. Um, where in ortho K, the cornea gets a break during the daytime, the lenses get full disinfection, you know, while the lens is at home and the child is at school, and it doesn't have that, uh, that water exposure uh, that a continuous wear um, soft contact lens would have. Um, another interesting thing, um, 
that I think as practitioners that we can kind of um, take to heart too, is that our younger contact lens wearing patients are actually the most compliant when it comes to care and handling. You teach them how to use it. You know, you rub the lens 15 times on both sides, you rinse it for five seconds, you know, whatever your care uh, is in um, care instructions are for handling their ortho K lenses. Kids don't know the cost of solutions. Um, kids don't think about cutting corners. You know, all they do is they do what they're told when it comes to these lenses. And they, again, once kids get rolling with their ortho K lenses, they get over that initial adaptation period. They're seeing, well, these kids do not want to come out of their ortho K lenses. They do amazing jobs of taking care of them. To be honest, like when it comes to any contact lens wear, my scleral lens patients, soft lens, you know, it doesn't matter. The ones that are kind of the most or the least compliant are those that have been wearing them for a really long time. And that's when they kind of start to get a little bit lazy with their contact lens hygiene. And so uh, to me, it's checking in with my patients that have been using ortho K lenses for a few years or any contact lens. That's when we have to kind of remind them like, hey, make sure you're cleaning the case, replacing the case. And these are all parts of our um, uh, every six month check-ins too. I'll remind the parents, hey, throw the case away, get a new one, run it through the dishwasher to disinfect it with the heat, you know, whatever the method is to keep them compliant. Those are things that we talk about at every touch point to keep patients safe. But, you know, again, thankfully the risk of keratitis is, or infectious keratitis is pretty darn low. And, you know, thankfully have yet to see one in my own practice. Um, So when it comes to ortho K in my clinic, I'm just going to provide a brief introduction on that. Um, our first visit is we'll set up a consult with the patient and the parents, and we'll do a quick refraction. We'll measure axial length, and then we'll talk about, you know, where the child is at and possible um, recommendations. Um, we talk about all recommendations, even though, again, like I personally love all the things that OrthoK does for patients. Um, we introduce all myopia management options, and um, the parents know their child better than I do, and so that helps us decide what modality we're going to use. But OrthoK is a popular one, and I'm, I'm grateful that parents trust my recommendation and belief in the technology. We can use things like this top left picture here that you see. Some of our instruments can create these models of what the lens will look like, and we can create the desired tear film. And the um, some lenses now can even be made quadrant um, designed. So I can change top from bottom, left from right, so that it really can align with all the asymmetries, um, you know, with corneal astigmatism and things like that. So you get a beautifully centered lens with an even tear layer and a nice uniform treatment zone across the visual axis. So we'll use some technology like that to create this custom lens, and um, then they'll come back for the dispense. During the follow-up care, um, the most important thing in my mind is watching for corneal staining. As you can see in this lens here, it's maybe a little bit shallow or a little bit tight. You know, there's not a lot of edge lift and we don't need to get into all the nuances of fitting, but you can see that there's some corneal staining there in the uh, center. And so this lens is, you know, probably binding down a little bit and not providing, you know, not allowing for adequate tear film thickness. Another little nuance that I think providers may be interested in starting ortho -K should know is that even though it looks like there's no tear film there because that that fluorescein pattern, um, it doesn't show any there, there is always a little bit of fluorescein um, in a properly fitting ortho K lens. So if I were to put a patient through maybe an anterior segment OCT, I would be able to measure a tear film underneath the entire cornea. So we're not changing the epithelium by pressure, we're changing it by those hydraulic forces. Um, so if you do have corneal staining, that's not normal, and we need to make an adjustment to the fit to allow for more fluid to kind of pass over that corneal apex. And so again, you know, corneal staining, that's what leads to breakdown, leads to infection. Um, so number one always is monitoring for corneal staining. And when we're monitoring axial length over the course of someone's um, care, we can use modules like this. So um, this is a module that's added to our instrument that can measure axial length. And um, I just love this because we can see the, the bottom numbers here where it shows at each measurement point um, how much axial length was there. And um, then it graphs it out too. And there are other modules um, or there are other aspects within this module that can show us if the patient's at risk, you know, considered a high progressor or a slow progressor. Um, and it can also, we can also mark the time points with the correction modalities. So if I were to add in something to maybe ortho K or soft lenses, it would show that, hey, at this point, you added a, a treatment method, and then we can see if that, you know, graft uh, trajectory changes. 
Um, so it's really nice to have tools like this. And there are three or four different instruments out there now that can measure axial length and create um, you know, some reference points like this. Um, and parents really find this very valuable as well, so that it's not just us saying everything looks good, you know, they can actually see it on a on a chart um, to see their modality and their investment in their kid working. The um, other image that we have here are, it's a paper um, comparing axial length changes in myopes to emetropes and it's age match progression. And so I use this table a lot. I have it pinned to my um, bulletin board here at my desk and when I'm analyzing a child for their progression. These are two studies, um, one out of Singapore and the other is the um, Orinda study, I believe. Yep, the Orinda longitudinal study of myopia. Basically, it says that these are the, on the left side, the myopes, untreated myopes at certain ages. This is what we would expect their myopia, their, their axial length changes to be year over year based on their age. And if they were emetropic, this is what we would expect. And so if I see a nine-year-old and their axial length changed by maybe, I'm a little bit less concerned because they are matched with their emetropic counterparts. Um, and so it helps me decide, is their axial length change considered just like pathologic versus just normal growth related to being a growing child? And so having this type of data has been very impactful in how I manage my patients. Um, this one here is kind of why I do OrthoK, and I'm sure you see this too, Vance, over the years with your parents and you know families that have um, used OrthoK and that kids love OrthoK. It is so hard to take them out of it if we had to for whatever reason. There's been a rare case over the years that we've elected to switch from OrthoK to soft lenses. Um, kids using OrthoK lenses, they report improved quality of life. They are more self-confident and willing to try new things. They're more likely to participate in sports. And they report higher overall vision scores compared to those that wear glasses. And it's like, when you see this, why would you not do it? You know, they're just, it. these are huge parts of being a confident, you know, uh, successful development through those years that can be challenging, like, you know, elementary school and junior high. So to have more self-confidence and be willing to try new things you know, those are just uh, platforms for successful progression into adulthood. Brooke, I uh, I find you'd be amazed at the thank you notes I get from parents that I referred uh, their child for ortho K, and and some of these thank you notes come years later. But but these are the reasons why. It, it's just a beautiful way to build a patient and the family relationship. It really is. It is. Yes. The family relationship is a huge part of myopia control. And um, I hold that, you know, very close to my heart as well. Next, we're going to hear from one of my other gold stars, um, Owen, and he's going to tell us about his first experience with his ortho -K lenses. The first time when I put them in, I thought it was going to be kind of scary. And but when I put them in, I it was a little scratchy at first. But when I got into the routine, I was blown away by what it could do. I could see across the room. I felt like Superman, basically. And that is that is the day-to-day -day with OrthoK patients. I have another uh, young guy about the same age as Owen, um, also about two years in on his OrthoK. And he uh, told his mom that if their house was on fire, the only thing he would grab are his OrthoK lenses. And it's just like, how um, sweet is that? It just, wow. again, if you need something to fill your cup, I mean, you got to do this. And so just to kind of wrap up today, uh, Vance, maybe I'll let you just, if you have any closing comments and um, any other suggestions for docs that are listening today. Um, you know, just again, the patient education and how every patient you see, I, I feel needs to be educated about this. There's wonderful websites, there's wonderful materials but we're helping people have a better visual life over the coming decades of their life. And, and so just the mere fact that you're watching this shows how much you care and you have so many other responsibilities as a provider, uh, but this is a big one to take care of your community and educate them, do the treatments yourself if you want or refer them on but let's just continue to increase the penetration of myopia control. Yeah, well said, absolutely. 
Um, these are my two future myopes here on this one. We're still hanging in there. They're not myopic yet, but it's probably in their future given their parental genetics. Um, and then I have two sites listed here, Myopia Profile and the Brandon, Brian Holden Vision Institute, uh, two excellent resources um, with vetted um, articles and data so that if you are using um, information off of these sites, you can feel really good about the accuracy in which you're offering to um, patients and their parents. Vance, thank you so much for taking some time to talk about myopia with me and excellent job on your acronyms with the myopia studies. There's so many out there and it's hard to keep track of everything. But again, that's why I lean into some of these sites for, for my data too. And so I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. Um, such a great talk on myopia control. And again, feels, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about a specific myopia control case in your practice or just curious about getting started, um, I'd be happy to talk to you. So thanks again, everyone.